I'm sure you know that in order to have a successful mobile application, you actually have to have some type of back end set up, right? You can't just have the front end where the UI looks nice, but then you don't have any data that you're actually working with. So today, I'm going to discuss how you can set up your own back end using MongoDB, Apollo Server, GraphQL, and Heroku. Let's go ahead and jump into it. So before we get started, I wanted to give a special shout out to a YouTube channel that I was watching to get a little bit more understanding of how to even set up all this stuff. So this guy name was Cooper Codes. He has a few videos talking about like GraphQL, Apollo Server and things like that. So I just wanted to give a shout out to him. Make sure you go follow him, show him some love. And hopefully if I don't describe everything in detail as I need to, you can get some extra information from him. All right, cool. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be using MongoDB as our database, and that is a NoSQL database, simply meaning that it has no structured query language, so it's way more flexible. It kind of operates in a way where you can have one document, so to speak, have different fields than another document. So kind of similar to Firebase, but it offers way more uh, filtering options and search options and things like that. So we'll be using MongoDB for the database today. We're also gonna be using Apollo Server, which is an open source GraphQL client. And we're gonna need this because we're gonna need somewhere to actually run our queries on our local host, as well as on the internet once we push it to the cloud. We're also gonna be using GraphQL, and that's essentially a query language that we'll be using to pull our data from MongoDB. The benefit of GraphQL is you can create one central location to get all your data. And then GraphQL can talk to MongoDB, Firebase, Elasticsearch, another REST client, whatever it is. It makes it convenient because all, we're need, all we need to do is talk to GraphQL. Uh, something cool to note is it was developed by Facebook in 2012 and then it was released to the public in 2015. So we're going to be using that in our app today. And last but not least, we're going to be using Heroku, which is a container based cloud platform as a service. And people use this in order to deploy, scale, and manage modern applications. We're gonna need this because we need to push our endpoints to the internet, that way we can test them live, not just on our local host. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead and set up our MongoDB database. So I'm gonna head over to mongodb.com. This is the main page. You wanna go ahead and create an account. I already have one, so I'm just gonna log into mine, all right? And this is the home page or the dashboard of MongoDB. And over here we have the projects. I have two projects right now. I'm going to create a new project today. Um, so I forgot to mention the, the premise of this API is we're going to be performing CRUD operations on a collection of books. So we need to be able to create a book, read a book, update a book and delete a book. Okay, very simple. So we're going to create a project. I'm going to call this books. And then it needs a permission owner or uh, the member, I'm sorry. And I'm going to specify that. Let me see. Oh, I'm just, I'm the project owner. So I'll just hit create project. All right. So we have our project created books. Now we need to create a database and MongoDB offers three tiers right now. Um, well, I, guess, I don't know if it's always done that or not, but they're serverless, dedicated and shared. So for this example, I'm going to go with the share tier simply because no credit card required and it's good for like basic configuration options like testing and things like that. So we don't really need all the bells and whistles. So I'll hit create here. I'll leave the cloud provider and region all the same AWS North Virginia for the region and leave all this information the same as well. Cluster name, keep it the same and we'll hit create cluster. All right. So now we need to create a username and password. This is how we're going to authenticate for the connection. So for this example, I'm just going to have a, a, a root username and a root password. Then I'll hit create user. So we need to keep that in mind later when we need to build our connection stream. And then finally, we need to add the entries to our IP access list. This is pretty much saying which, um, well, only these IP addresses can be accessed or be connected to the cluster. And for this demo purpose, I'm going to allow anyone to connect. So we're going to put 0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
zero dash zero, okay? You don't wanna do this in production because that means anyone can connect to your cluster, but just for this example, I'll do it. Then I'll hit finish and close. All right, congratulations on setting up access rules. Now we need to go to our database. As you can see right now, the cluster zero is still loading. It takes a couple minutes to load up. So once that's loaded, uh, we can get started. So I'll be right back. All right, our cluster is loaded. Now what we need to do is we need to go in and create a collection for our data. So I'm going to click add my own data, the database name. This probably isn't the best naming convention, but we're just gonna call it books. And then the collection will be called books as well. So we have a database called books within our project books and the collection is called books. Now keep in mind for a collection, you might have another collection for users or settings or notifications or whatever it is, but all we need right now is this books collection. All right, so that's done. This is where all our data will be for our books. Now if we go back to the database and we hit connect, then we hit connect your application. This right here is going to be the connection string that we're going to be using in GraphQL in order to connect to MongoDB and get the, the data. So I'm just gonna copy this for now, but just know that if I pull the connection string up later in the video, I got it from here, okay? And then all we need to do is we need to replace the password with our password, which is root, and then specify the name of the database right before this question mark. So it'll be books, question mark, blah, 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 okay? That's all we need to do on the MongoDB end. Now let's go ahead and set up Apollo server. All right, so the first thing that we need to do when setting up the Apollo server is we need to create an empty project. So I created this new project called Books Demo Apollo Server. Nothing in it right now, but what we need to do first is we need to initialize a Node.js project within this app. So we'll run the first command npm init dash dash yes and that's going to give us this package.json file right here okay the next thing that we need to do is we need to install the node.js i'm sorry the npm packages that are necessary for actually creating the server and that's going to be apollo server graphql and mongo i'm sorry mongoose that's the npm package for mongodb so call npm install at apollo dash server graphql and mongoose let that go ahead and fetch what we need all right and you can see we have our dependencies now then we also need some dev dependencies in order to work with typescript so we'll run npm install uh, dash dash save dev uh, typescript oops and then at types slash node okay and that gives us our dev dependencies to work with typescript all right, we also need to create an index.ts file because this is where we're going to be putting all the logic for our server at. So we'll go up here. Uh, we need to create a source directory first. Oops, not a source file. New folder source. Index.ts. All right. So this is where we're going to be putting all the logic once we get to the GraphQL part of the video. We also need to create a tsconfig.json file, which is just the extra information related to like how we're treating JavaScript files. Um, we're going to be treating them as modules. And then we also need to specify which part of the app is seen first when the app is deployed to the server, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So we'll just come here, tsconfig.json file. And then I just copy and pasted this from the Apollo server documentation, but this is essentially what you need um, for the tsconfig.json file. I'm not too familiar with all of these commands or properties, but I know, you know, some of them like the out directory, which is going to be our DIST folder. That's going to specify that we want to be using the compiled JavaScript files for our out directory. Then we also have the root directory, which is the source types or node, et cetera, et cetera. So don't get too caught up on all this information, but just know that that's necessary for your tsconfig.json file. All right, then we also need to go back to our package.json file and we need to add type node as a property. Oops, let's see, type, I'm sorry, not node, module, because we're gonna be treating the JS files as modules. Um, so I misspoke, I'm sorry, the tsconfig JSON file doesn't specify if we're using JS files as modules, but this is the file that does. Then we need to modify the scripts, 
command and we need to specify three things. First, we have a compile command that's simply going to be the TypeScript command. So when we run compile, we're essentially compiling our TypeScript files. Then we have a build command, which is npm run compile. So when we build, we are, build, we are compiling our TypeScript files. And then finally, we have a start command, which is node-dist dist source index.js. This essentially says that once we start the server, we're going to be looking in the disk directory, source directory, index.js file, which was compiled from our index.ts file, okay? So that's all you need on the Apollo server side setup. Let's go ahead and jump into the graph, GraphQL part of the video. All right, now we need to go ahead and do a few things for setting up the GraphQL aspect. So as I mentioned, we're working with books for our API. So we need to create a model, which will be the schema that we need to use to represent how our book data is going to be transferred from, you know, endpoints essentially. So come in here, uh, I guess we'll create a models directory. We can do that. Call it models and then call it book.ts. Okay, I'm gonna close these out. First, we need to do some imports. We need to import schema and model from Mongoose. Okay, then we need to create an interface that's gonna represent the document in Mongoose. So, interface, call it iBook. First property on iBook is going to be the ID. It's going to be ID, question mark, because it could be nullable. Uh, then we're going to have the author of the book, which is a string, the title of the book, another string, and then the year of the book, which is going to be a number, okay? Then we need to create the schema that is going to be referencing uh, that document. So call it const book schema equals new schema and it's going to be of type iBook and essentially going to be the same thing as up there, uh, just slightly different based on some extra params that we have. So we'll say the type is string and then we need to specify is it required, uh, we can do true. So what we're saying is Whenever we submit a book model and the author is null or something, it's gonna throw an error saying this is required, okay? The ID is not necessary because the ID is given after the book has been created. So we'll leave that blank. So I'm gonna just copy and paste this for the next few, oops. Now that didn't work how I wanted it to, but that's all right. All right, and the author, and we have title and then the year. Okay, and that was a number. All right, perfect. Then finally, we need to actually create the model down here. So we'll call const book equals model of type iBook. And then we need to specify the name of that collection, which is books, and then pass in the book schema. All right, and then finally, export default book. All right, so that's all we need to do for our book model. Then we need to come over to our index.ts file and import the Apollo server instance because now we're going to be actually setting up the server. So we'll call it import Apollo server from Apollo server. Um, then we also need to import the standalone server. Uh, is it going to give it to me? Actually, start standalone server from Apollo server standalone, is that right? There we go. Uh, we also need to use the connect class from Mongoose. That's what we're going to be using for actually connecting our mon or connecting to our Mongoose database. And then finally, we need to import the book model. So we'll say import book from model dot dot models book and then yeah there we go uh we don't need these brackets around it 
All right, so we're using Apollo server for our server instance and standalone server is what we're going to pass that server instance into. The connect is going to connect our Mongo's database and then the book model that we need when we're creating the book. Uh, I added the .js uh, notation to this. Um, for some reason, I was getting errors about I can't find the JS file when it wasn't attached. So um, probably a rookie mistake on my end, but just for this example, I'm just gonna add that so we can avoid any errors. Then we need to connect to MongoDB. So we will, um, we need to create our connection string. I'm sorry, const MongoDB. And I'm just going to paste in that connection string from earlier. As you see, I replaced the password section with root. And then I specified the name of the database in front of the question mark. So this is our connection string right here. Then we need to set up the type depths for GraphQL. And the type depths are pretty much type definitions, letting GraphQL know um, what the data is going to be looking like. So as far as like the input the models and things like that, queries, mutations, all that good stuff. So we'll call const type defs equals these two back ticks. And we need to put pound GraphQL up here. You really don't need that, um, but actually, I don't know if you need that or not. It was in the documentation, so we're just gonna leave it in. Then we need to specify our first type, which is a book, okay? And this is essentially kind of like what we just did with the model. So we'll just copy and paste this. Only thing is we don't need these commas on the end. And the ID of the book is actually underscore ID because in MongoDB, the IDs are underscore ID. So just keep that in mind. When you're dealing with MongoDB, you already have an ID field by default and it's underscore ID. Also, we need to change the year to an int, okay? Then we have an input type, which is going to be book input. And we're using this structure whenever we are updating or creating a book okay so this is going to have the same fields uh, just as the book minus the id because when we're creating a new book we don't need an id next thing we need to do is specify our queries this is a big part of graphql this is letting graphql know which queries that we're creating queries are essentially ways that you would read data and then mutations are a way that you would mutate or modify data so the create, update, and delete methods would be mutations, and then the read methods would be queries. So we'll specify type query, and we have our two queries, get book, which is going to be ID, and we're passing an ID at an exclamation point because, exclamation point because it's required, and then its return type is a book. So we will always, when you add the exclamation point, you're pretty much saying it's required, so we will always expect a book back. Then we have a function or a query called get books and we'll be passing in a limit of type int. So the limit is saying how many books do we want returned from this query? So we can specify that when we actually test it out, but then it's going to be returning an array of books. Okay, those are the queries right there. Then we need to specify our mutations. Like I said earlier, mutations are gonna be the things that actually change the data. So the first one we need is create book and we're gonna be passing in a book input and that's going to return a string of the ID once it's created. We also have update book, and we would need to pass in the ID of the book we wanna update as well as new book input information. And that's going to return the string as well. And then finally, delete book. All we need is the ID of the book that we wanna delete. And we're gonna return the string of the ID as well. You might wanna have different return types for all these methods, but I figured just for this example, if the query is successful, just return the ID of whatever book was just modified. So those are the type defs. Now we need to create our resolvers and this lets GraphQL know how we should resolve or, or what type of queries is special. So now we have the type defs created, we need to create the resolvers, which is gonna let GraphQL know how to fetch the types described in our schema. So we have that. I'm gonna bring this down just a little bit. We'll call it const resolvers, resolvers. First thing that we need is the query. And we're just pretty much mapping out these, the queries and the mutations down here to the resolvers. And we're actually specifying what that function looks like when it's called. So it's gonna be an async function for the first one, get book. 
and we're passing in that ID. I'm sorry. Uh, something to keep in mind with the resolvers, it takes in four params uh, for each function. You have parents, arguments, context value, and info. So for each function, we're only passing in arguments. So the first param, we can put an underscore because we're not using the parent. And all we need to do is then just specify the arguments. So the argument that we're passing for ID is going to be the ID. I'm sorry, we're just passing the ID like this. And then from there, we want to return a book and we'll call uh, a mongoose method called find. And then we specify, uh, actually we need to call find by ID. And then we're just passing that ID, okay? So this is essentially what one of the resolver methods would look like. Let's try another one. Uh, forget books, put that underscore in there and we're passing in the limit, which is the limit of books that we want to get returned back. So this will do uh, book dot book dot find, and then we'll sort the books as well. Um, and we want them sorted by the date that they, actually we don't need to sort them. We can take the sort out. So we find and then limit to that limit that we pass in, okay? Also need to add the await keyword to these functions because um, we'll just be waiting all day or we won't get the data that we need um, when we actually run the query. So these are what the queries look like. Now we need to specify mutations. All right, so similar to up top, it's an async function. We'll call create book, pass in that underscore, and then we'll pass in a book input. And that book input is going to be author, title, and year, okay? So down here in the function, we need to create a new book. Uh, so we'll say, so within the function, we'll call const res equals new book. And we're gonna pass in the author, title, and year, just like that. Then we'll call the save method. Okay, make sure that we await this. Now this is essentially saying that we need to create a new book document in our collection and then save it. Then once we have it saved, if everything works smooth, we'll just return res dot underscore ID. Because remember, the IDs in MongoDB are underscore ID. So if the create book works successfully, we'll just return that ID. All right, then we have, uh, let's do the delete book. Now we'll do update, just keep it in sync. So for update book, same thing as up top, but we need to pass in that ID as well as the book input, which is author title year. So in this one, we're gonna call book.update1, and we need to specify the ID, which is gonna be that ID. And then we need to call the set method, which is a method in MongoDB that's going to update the properties of that document. So we'll wrap this in parentheses actually, call set. And then we're just gonna pass in that author title in year right here. Okay. If that's if that everything runs smooth with that, we're gonna return the ID as well. Uh, whoops. If everything runs smooth with that, we're gonna return that ID just like that. Okay. Um, the reason I'm doing just passing the ID normally is because we don't have that res property here. And then finally, for delete book. Same thing as up top, passing the ID. That's all we need is the ID, actually. And we're just gonna call await book.remove and then specify the ID of the document that we want to remove. If everything runs smooth, return the ID. All right, we got our type defs and our resolvers all here. Now we need to go ahead and connect to our MongoDB. So we'll hit await, connect, and then pass in that MongoDB connection. Then we need to create an instance of our Apollo server. So we'll call const server equals Apollo server. And it's gonna take in two properties. It's gonna take in those type depths that we created up top as well as, as, well as the resolvers. Make sure I add the new there, all right? So that's our server instance. Then we need to specify which port we're listening to for the server. 
So we'll say const URL equals await standalone server. We'll pass in that server. Then we're gonna be listening on port 4000. All right. And then if everything runs smooth, we'll just do a console log server is ready at URL. Oops, I gotta do these as back ticks. All right, so that's all we need for the index.ts file. Now we're gonna go ahead and jump into actually building it and seeing what it looks like in Apollo Server. So come down here, npm run build. This is going to compile our ts file. It created that dist folder for us. We have our index.js. Now we just need to run npm run start. Give us a little um, warning message, but you can ignore that. All right, server is ready at localhost 4000. Perfect. So we got the app running on the server. Let's go ahead and open localhost 4000. And as you can see here, this is Apollo server. This is kind of like a playground for testing the endpoints. And over here we have our queries, but we don't have the mutations. And that is because, yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, it's mutation, not mutations. So we're gonna change that close the server and rebuild this. All right, and we'll call npm build again. We're gonna rebuild that. And then we're gonna start the server again. And it should work this time. We should be able to see our mutations on there. All right, let's refresh this. Oh, didn't even need to refresh. Okay, so we have our queries and our mutations. All right, so first thing that we can do, we can test out this endpoint. Let's go ahead and create some books. So we can click mutation, uh, not, not all those, uh, create book, and then pass in the uh, book input for our arguments, and then select all the input fields. So this is what this is doing is we're specifying the variables that are going to go into that book input variable, and then within the operation, it will take that book input, pass it to the create book query. All right, so let's create our first book. We'll call this, uh, Let's go Malcolm Gladwell, good author, right? Malcolm Gladwell, and we'll call this book Outliers. It's a good book. I don't know what year it came out, but we're gonna just say 2020 for this example. So then we'll hit mutation, and now the create book was successful because we got an ID back, okay? So we can test another endpoint. Let's actually, let's create another book just to, to have multiple in there. Uh, it's another book, Setting Boundaries. Uh, I don't think that's the name of the exact title, but just, just work with me here. Whoops. Did I get that the wrong? No, I did that right. All right. Um, yeah, let me, I'm trying to blame. What's a good author? We'll go with Dr. Seuss. You can't lose with Dr. Seuss, right? And then Cat in the Hat. All right. And we'll say that came out in 1992. All right. So we got two books in our, in our database now. And we can check this by running the get books endpoint. So if we come back to root, we're gonna do a query now. So we'll select query, get books, pass in the limit, and the properties that we want back are ID, author, title, and year. So that's the cool thing about GraphQL is you can specify what data you want to come back. So we'll put two on here, because we got two books. And then we'll hit the query and we get back the two documents that are in our MongoDB collection, uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, Cat in the Hat by Dr. Seuss, okay? If we were to take one of these properties off, like let's say we just wanted the title of the book and then ran the query, we would just get the title back. So very convenient um, in, the, in that regard. So let's try our endpoint for um, updating a book. So let me see. Let me get the ID of the book first. Can we do that? Okay. So we're gonna update Cat in the Hat. So we'll need that ID. Clear all this out. Then we'll run a mutation, update book. Passing the, we need the arguments to be ID and book input. Whoops. And we want to update the author, title, and year. So for the ID, we're gonna pass in the ID of the Cat in the Hat book. And then we're gonna change the author to Trey Hope and the year to 1970. 
we'll keep the title null because we want to keep cat in the hat. So we're only updating these two fields. Okay. So now if we hit the mutation, uh, update book was successful. Let's go back to actually let's run our endpoint for getting a single book now. So we'll go to query, get book, passing in the ID, and we want all these fields brought back. Then we'll specify the ID of that cat in the hat book. And as you can see now, whoops. Oh, it updated it. Maybe that wasn't supposed to happen. All right. So I think that updating, since not since we didn't pass in a value for the title, it got rid of cat in the hat. So I think the set method actually it sets those values. So I misspoke earlier. Make sure that when you're using the set method in MongoDB, we can go back here and look at it. Right here, this method, if you don't pass in a value, it will set that value to null. I think there might be another, maybe like an update variation of this to where it only updates the values that are specified. Um, no, you know what, Ashley? I know exactly what it is now. If we run let me see. Let's run that update book again and pass in the book input. If we leave out the author and the title, so if we don't even pass it as a parameter, it shouldn't change anything. So let's say uh, title, cat in the hat, and then the year 2017. So we're updating this document again, right? But I'm not passing in the author this time. So the author should still be Trey Hope. The title should be Cat in the Hat and the year should be 2017. Okay, so if we go back here to our query, get book by the ID, there we go. Author, Trey Hope, title was updated, year 2017. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Whatever data you don't want updated in GraphQL, don't even pass it as a param, all right? All right, and the last thing that we need to do is we need to test our delete endpoint so we can go back to root go to mutation delete book and we're passing the id so we're going to delete that cat in the hat book all right that was successful and we can validate this by going back to our get books query and we should only have one book coming back now and i'm going to leave the id null on limit that means it's just going to bring back whatever there's no limit to what it brings back Perfect, so that cat in the hat book was deleted. So all of our endpoints are working, the create, the read, the update, and delete. Now that this is working, we can go ahead and push this server up to Heroku, that way we can, we can test these endpoints live. All right, so we're on the dashboard for heroku.com. I've already logged in. Keep in mind that you would need to create a profile for yourself, but it's free to set up. Right here, right here I have this project already that I'm for another app that I'm working on, but we're gonna be creating a new one for our books demo today. So we'll come over to new, create new app, and we're just gonna call it the same thing, books demo Apollo server, all right? And then hit create app, cool. So we got that, um, our app created. So here's some information on how to deploy to Heroku, but I already got that covered, so. First thing is we need to modify this index.ts file as well, because now we are going to be, instead of listening only to localhost 4000, we need to be listening to the environment variable uh, port value um, when it's on Heroku. So we can do that by creating a new port variable, um, number.parseInt, and we're gonna be calling the process.env.port variable. And if that's not available, which means that we're running on local hosts, then we'll just default to the 4,000 value. So we'll exchange this 4,000 value for port. Perfect. And let me go ahead and build this just so that we have the updated JS file when it's time. NPM run build. All right. So now what we need to do is for deployment, I use the Heroku CLI. Um, I have the command right here. You can do it's just using brew, so brew tap Heroku dash brew and brew install Heroku. That'll install it for you. I already have it, so all it would do is just give me an update. So I'm gonna skip that. The next step is you need to log into Heroku from the command line. You hit, hit Heroku login, uh, press any key, to open the browser. Actually, I'm not gonna log in that way because I have a different IP address right now, but you can also log in 
with your normal credentials. So I'll just do that this way. All right, so we are now logged into Heroku. Now we need to create a Git repository in this project because we essentially are going to be adding this project to Heroku's Git. So first we need to call Git init, all right? And then we'll call Heroku Git remote-a and specify the name of our app in Heroku, which is Heroku Git Remote. I'm sorry, books, demo, Apollo server. All right, so that's added. Now we need to add these files, just call git add dot, then create a commit message. Same thing as git normally, but this is for Heroku. Git commit dash m initial upload. Finally, we need to push this to the Heroku server. So we'll call git push Heroku main. All right, we're gonna let that deployment take a second. All right, it says build succeeded. Should almost be done now. And something to keep in mind, like I said, we pushed up to Heroku's Git, we didn't push to our normal Git. So if we want to push our files up to our Git repository, we would need to do an additional Git push main. All right, so Heroku and Git are two different Git repositories. All right, so our push worked. We should see that we had a deployed right here. Perfect. All right, so now it's on Heroku. Let's go ahead and test out this endpoint using a Rust client. All right, so we have it on Heroku now. So what we can do now is test it out in Thunder client, which is uh, kind of like Postman, but allows you to test different endpoints um, native to VS Code. So when I say native, I mean you can test them inside the application. So I have some, let's just create a new request. We'll do that. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run Apollo server, that way I can just copy the GraphQL commands from Apollo server into this endpoint uh, or into uh, Thunder Client and we'll test it that way. So let's see here, clear all this out. And then for our endpoint, we need to pass in the endpoint for our books demo Apollo server, all right? So, and you can get this um, from here, I believe if you hit access, no, cool. no, if you hit open app, you just copy that endpoint right there. All right. So we'll just pass that endpoint into here. And now what we need to do is we need to go over to the body, GraphQL, and here we'll just, uh, specify the commands that we want to test. So let's test out get books first. So we hit get books limit ID all right we can just copy this operation over into VS code for Thunder client and then we'll run our operation uh nine to query oh should be a post I'm sorry so if we hit post we get our result back we get data get books and then the information for that book all right let's try get book for that same ID. I'm gonna clear this out. I'm gonna do get book and we'll pass in the ID of that book. Copy this over. So now we're just getting a single book by its ID, hit send. All right, we get that back. Let's try, and something to keep in mind is you can use GraphQL or you can use JSON, XML, whatever you wanna use, but just for convenience to show that this actual endpoint is working for us, I'm using GraphQL just for simplicity this time. All right, so we've tried our queries. Let's try some mutations out. Let's try a create book mutation. And this author will be, let's make me the author again. The title of my book is How to Learn Flutter. And this will come out next year. All right, be on the lookout for that. So we'll copy that mutation, put it in here, copy these variables. Put them in here, hit send. All right, we got our create book. Uh, it worked successfully and we can check that out. Take a little shortcut here. We'll do get books again, no limit, and paste this all in here. Now, as you can see, that book that we just created, Trey Hope, How to Learn Flutter, worked there. Let's try another mutation. Let's update my book. Let's change the title of it. 
mutation update book book input let's change the title we don't need to change anything else oops passing the id and the title is not going to be um title that's a terrible title but just for this example all right so i'm changing the title of my book from how to learn flutter to title unexpected jason oh don't need that comma all right that book was updated let's try getting the books again to make sure that that update took place all right trey hope still the author still come out in 2023 but the title of the book is now titled all right and last but not least let's try deleting this book i'm going to create a new request because i'm tired of opening uh, or copy and pasting all this information over so we're going to make this a post and we're going to delete now so if we go to the delete mutation uh, hit delete book pass the id and dang that was right no no all right i got it we're going to pass that as the id so in our new request passing those variables and then passing that mutation all right book was deleted now if we run it again our book was successfully deleted so the crud operations are all working perfectly how they need to on the server live all right so that is essentially how you set up a back end for your application whether it be a mobile app or a web app or whatever you see all four of these technologies are pretty powerful uh, mongodb graphql apollo server heroku and they all work simultaneously to make this back end that we needed for our application as always, if this video was helpful, please like, comment, subscribe. Let me know anything that I can kind of dive in deeper about or explain further. And be on the lookout for the next video where I'll be using the same endpoint to make a Flutter app. All right. Enjoy your holidays and I'll see you next year.